Good evening. Um, I'm Neil Stratford, and I'm the chairman of the Corpus of Romanesque Sculpture in Britain and Ireland. And um, it's my pleasant duty tonight to introduce our lecturer. I'll come to him in a moment. Um, but I'd first like to, to just say one or two things about, about the corpus, ready to bring you up, up to date. Um, I know a lot of you here are, are field workers and already in the picture, but uh, some of you won't be. And uh, um, like a politician, which I'm not, uh, I wanted to give you some st statistics. You know, when, when they uh, under threat or something, a politician always produces statistics. Um, so. Uh, the corpus has been going now on a voluntary basis, well, voluntary assistant basis, um, since the 1980s, when we were founded. When we were founded by um, George Jarnetsky, and um, since then there have been periods of intense production and periods of lesser production, but we've now reached a, a very advanced position indeed, and um, I wanted to, to tell you that we've got 2,838 sites um, published by 41 volunteers in the field. We've received 142,000 hits during 2018. I think that's very impressive. Uh, and We've had 56,000 users. Um, we've uh, the 70,500 um, sessions have been opened. 70% of users um, are UK based. 7.5% are American-based, and 13% of visitors are from the rest of the world. I hope that gives you some kind of idea of the scope and indeed of the success of the project. There's also a moment, I think, in the year to, to thank um, our several benefactors. We live uh, a little bit from hand to mouth but we've received some very generous donations um, in 2018 and 2019. Now, uh, tonight's um, lecturer is Ron Baxter. And Ron has very, very kindly, very gallantly, I think, uh, agreed to step into the breach. Because, of course, our, our announced uh, lecturer was Xavier Decto. Uh, who's the, uh, the chairman of the management board. And uh, uh, Xavier, for family reasons, uh, um, simply can't be here tonight. And there's nothing he could do about it. And uh, the, it, the message came through at 4 o'clock uh, this morning. On uh, An email came through saying that he really had to go to France to be with his father in hospital. So it really is uh, uh, a very unfortunate um, side to his absence. Perhaps we can persuade him to come back and give the annual lecture next year. Anyway, um, Ron Baxter, who is our director of research, who must be known to almost everybody in this room, um, has very kindly, Ron, thank you so much for agreeing to, to step into the breach at the last minute. Um, Ron, um, as we say, needs no introduction, 
but I just remind you of one or two of his achievements. Um, his book on bestiaries um, was published in 1998 by Alan Sutton Publishers and the Courtauld Institute. And that's his, his, uh, one of his two principal publications, the other one being on Reading Abbey, which is the subject of his lecture this evening. Um, and Ron is the, the rock on which uh, the court held, um, oh, the, the corpus, I'm sorry, is, is founded. Um, and he's recorded and edited well in excess of a thousand sites for the corpus over the years. Um, his title this evening, and I think we're in for a treat, is The Surviving Architecture and Sculpture of Reading Abbey. So, Ron Baxter. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. And um, I guess, like yourselves, I was really looking forward to hearing about the Port Ice and Town. It's one of my favourite door early Gothic doorways in, in France. But instead, I'm afraid you're going to get me. And <laughs> I should say, to start with, that uh, there's a good deal going on in Reading, if you want to know why I'm talking about Reading. The borough has received a lot of funding to make what was once a largely ignored ruin in the middle of the town, closed until last year, for 10 years, um, into um, something whose, whose true value has never been recognized before. It goes hand in hand with um, attempts by many scholars, not just me, to establish the Abbey in Reading as one of the major medieval and royal sites in England. So it's big, it's important, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. So Reading Abbey's a ruin, as I'm sure you know, and you're all familiar with ruined abbeys. They look like this. Byland in the North Riding of Yorkshire, seen from the west. And what's on site is very, very clear. A cruciform church, square eastern arm, a cloister on the south side of the nave, and clearly defined ranges on the other three sides of the cloister. We have ashlar-faced walls for the most part, and in the places where they're lost, English heritage has helpfully emphasized the foundations for us. In fact, if you want a clearer idea of what the monastery looked like in its prime, all you need to do is to bring the walls up a bit and put some roofs on, scatter a few monks around, and there you are. Try doing that with Reading Abbey, and you run into a few snags. This is the best I could manage in the way of an aerial view. And take it from me, pretty much the entire abbey is on there. I've stuck a compass rose on to help you to orientate yourself. This yellow square is the position of the cloister, with the east side at the bottom. This red arrow is the south transept of the church, and this one is the chapter house. The big building to the south is the dormitory and its undercroft, and that runs right down to the rear daughter and the holy brook, a canal cut out of the River Kennet to supply the Abbey's water and drainage needs. Let's go back to the aerial view. These buildings there are Pugin's Catholic Church of St James, his priest house and his school, and they sit on the crossing and the north transept of the Abbey Church. In fact, there's the church, there's the priest house. 
In fact, a good deal of the north transept still stands in the back garden of the priest house, but it's all rather cramped and overgrown with vegetation in there. The area around the Catholic enclave is an unofficial car park, and two more chunks of north transept masonry stand there. So, what are we left with? Basically, the presbytery and the nave. The nave um, over here. I could have used the pointer. <laughs> the nave over here was the site of a siege in the Civil War. And um, during that siege, a ditch and a rampart were dug across it. Um, here's, the, um, here's the ditch and the rampart, you see, going over there. There's the nave, there's the cloister, and here's the presbytery. So, that's uh, planned by Sir Henry Englefield of the late 18th century. <coughs> This is Grimm's view of it, um, northwest view of the ruins, and you can clearly see in the foreground the ditch running across it. Because the church was pulled down so early, there were no antiquarian views that show very much of the nave. And the best we can do, I think, is this. <coughs> This is Martin Reynoldson's view of 1768. To the left of the nave wall, you can see the inner south transept chapel and the lady chapel there, so south transept, lady chapel. Here's the nave wall and here's the uh, chapter house entrance and the east wall of the cloister. Um, The dark line in the foreground there, the little diagonal line, that marks the edge of the Civil War ditch. If you stand just here, <coughs> ignoring the reactions of the 18th century horsemen to the sudden appearance of a giant from the future, if you stand there and travel forward in time 250 years, the view you will see is this, Abbot's Walk in Reading. In other words, the houses at the east end of Abbot's Walk merge seamlessly with the beginning of the South Nave Isle Wall, indicating that the line of the Isle Wall is preserved in the facade of that 1840s terrace. Now, as for the presbytery, the standing remains are best preserved on the south side. This is the south presbytery aisle looking east. Okay? On the right here, no, not there, go back. On the right here is the aisle wall. At the far end, the brick wall of the former jail closed in 2013, and this might be turned into an arts venue, they say. Um, and the east end of the presbytery, therefore, as you can see from that, must be under the prison. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that we don't know what it looked like, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Meanwhile, the wall on the left there is, belongs to the former Catholic school, and this wall stands on the line of the South Presbytery Arcade, because what we have here is one of the arcade pier bases still in place. As you can see, the base of a cylindrical pier with a small rest bond on the aisle side to carry a vault rib. 
The form of the eastern termination of the presbytery was revealed by Cecil Slade, who obtained permission to excavate under the prison in the 1970s. And this is his excavation plan. That shows the north side of an ambulatory with radiating chapels, a large central one flanked by two smaller ones, who we assume two smaller ones. In combination with the surviving chapels on the south transept, those two we're seeing on the south transept, um, the large inner one on the left surviving to the top of the windows and a smaller one to the right of it with walls standing for just a foot or two we have an eastern arm arrangement with a total of seven chapels like this which has similarities to the plans of various English great churches of the period now notice that what happened to the central ambulatory chapels at Gloucester and Tewkesbury, that is to say the building of a large lady chapel to replace it, also happened at Reading. But I'm going to concentrate on the 12th century building and ignore the 14th century lady chapel. I should just add that this kind of plan which defines a route for pilgrims to visit altars and venerate relics is a version of the European pilgrimage church plan as used at Tours, Limoges, Comte, Toulouse and ultimately Santiago de Compostela itself. Destination of pilgrims who wish to venerate the high value in terms of indulgence or remission of purgatory time, the high value apostolic relic of St. James the Great. And it can't be a coincidence that Reading also claimed a relic of St. James. His hand, preserved, presented by Henry I's daughter, the Empress Matilda, along with a rich collection of some 230 precious items, bones, blood and hair that were catalogued at the end of the 12th century. To return to the architecture, we have a plan, but what about the elevation of the church? One thing we can be pretty sure of is that it had a tower over the crossing. It's not there now and it appears on no antiquarian views, but the main evidence is the massiveness of the crossing piers. These piers here, 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 here. <coughs> two of which do survive for a couple of feet. So from the standing remains, the antiquarian drawings and a few excavations, we can make a reasonable guess at what the church looked like. And here are a few reconstructions by Stuart Harrison. Almost all of the ashlar facing of the standing buildings has gone now, stripped from the rubble cores and used elsewhere in the dis after the dissolution in 1539. We know, for instance, that in 1558, Queen Elizabeth I gave the town permission to use abbey stones for municipal repairs, including the repair of bridges. And if you can persuade the authorities to close the appropriate sluices to lower the water level, you can wade through it and see that part of the roof has been reinforced with 12th century rib vault bourgeois. I think that boat tours of the Holy, Holy Brook are occasionally offered too. Um, they check the rib profiles and that's what I find. And this, of course, proves that some of the spaces in the abbey were rib vaulted. And the fact that there are at least six profiles suggests that quite a few of them were. Apart from the work in the town, we have accounts from around 1557 for payments to masons digging out Ashler 
from the Lady Chapel walls, doors and windows for the new Poor Knights lodgings at Windsor Castle. Examples could easily be multiplied and we mustn't forget too that Elizabeth quarried the Abbey Stone for Ashler for the new stables that she built to serve the royal palace that the monastery was converted into after the monks were evicted. <coughs> so, by the time of the earliest antiquarian views in the mid-18th century, there was very little more Ashlar on the rubble cores than we can see today. There's still a bit surviving, for instance, on the southwest crossing pier, which tells us a couple of things. First, that the Ashlar masonry was very good indeed, with very fine mortar courses between accurately squared blocks and that the stone was Tate and Lime, Taint and Limestone from the Windrush Valley in Oxfordshire, 50 miles to the northwest. Long way, but... You can see that transport was pretty easy. The Windrush is a tributary of the Thames, which runs half a mile, within half a mile of the Abbey to the north, so the transport was really straightforward. Elsewhere, even though the Ab Ashler's gone, the impression is left in the rubble, so that quite a lot can be deduced. This is the dormitory doorway from the east walk of the cloister, and although the Ashler face in any sculpture's gone, it's clear enough that there were three orders of archers here, their impressions left in the Ashler core, like something like by Rachel White Reed, which is why I was shocked to see what had been done to another doorway, that from the south nave aisle into the north walk of the cloister. Here it is in 2003, and when I went back ten years later, this is what I saw. Another view of the most picturesque part of the ruins, to make a couple of points. First, when you examine rubble cores in this way, you must be on the lookout for old restorations that can distort the picture. Here, the upper part of the wall has been rebuilt, um, with a more flinty mix there at the top in comparison with the uh, original core which has got a much higher proportion of lime mortar and a more varied mixture of hard core. But lower down the wall is fine and what's obvious is that the elevation was heavily articulated. The windows are multi-ordered and below them, the wall is thin and recessed, while to the sides, the wall is built out with multi-order respons, a treatment that's typical of Reading. Here, for example, is the west wall of the south trans transept. Um, yeah, the, west, the west wall there. This is actually the side wall of the chapter house, the slype. The two chapels that I just showed you are actually around there. And this is the um, Presbytery Isle, South Presbytery Isle. Um, in the background, Reading's tallest building, the Blade. You can see from here that the wall responds stand out from the plane of the wall surface. And if you move in closer, the positions of robbed out individual blocks of stone are visible. Now, I'm going to have to take, ask you to take something at least partly on trust. This is the top of the same wall, seen face on from the east. The top of the wall has been consolidated to make it level. But it seems clear that these respawns there continue right to the top, past the springing of the archers, which must be about 
here, base, which we can estimate from the position of the bases. This means that the respond didn't enclose the lower windows, but continued up the wall. We have to remain, remember too that this is just the ground level of the elevation. There was another story above making the wall twice as high originally as it is now. And what this reconstruction <coughs> suggests is that these pilasters continued up the wall and that there may have been archers enclosing the upper clear street windows. This arrangement is what architectural historians call a giant order and always this is compulsory, always illustrate by showing this building because it gives a clear idea of what a giant order looks like. It also serves to remind me that the giant order is a Roman imperial form which makes it appropriate for a royal foundation like Reading. The story of the giant order in England is a complicated and confusing one but in brief, we have ambiguous evidence for one in the Chancellor at Tewkesbury in the 1090s, but the earliest definite survival seemed to be the names of Dunstable Priory and Romsey. Dunstable was an Augustinian house built by Henry I 10 years after Reading. The cloister is gone, so we only have the arcade and gallery openings converted to windows in the elevation. See how the respons rise from ground level and enclose the gallery so that the plane of the wall of the gallery and the arcade is set back. The nunnery of Romsey was a royal house too. The first abbess was a granddaughter of Alfred the Great and the royal link was maintained into the 12th century. Henry I's wife, Edith Matilda, was his first wife, daughter of Malcolm III of Scotland. She was educa educated there, and the rebuilding in the 1130s and 40s is connected with Henry of Bois, brother of King Stephen. So it would be reasonable to build it in imitation of Henry's great, Henry I's great burial church at Reading. And it would make sense that Reading would have a giant order too. And the elevation may have looked something like Romsey, but much taller and, I would suggest, heavily decorated with sculpture. Ah. Am I too quiet? Just mm, thank you. <laughs> Before the 21st century, writers on English medieval architecture had very little to say about Reading Abbey. Geoffrey Webb's 1956 volume in the Pelican History of Art is typical. He mentions Reading Abbey only twice, both times to say that it had some newly discovered sculpture. By now, this sculpture is recognized as being among the masterworks of the English Romanesque. The origins of many of its motifs can be seen in the lands in southern Normandy held by King Henry before he became king in 1100 in the area around Donfron, especially at Longley and Galt. Um, this is a um, comparison of a cloister capital from Reading with two pairs of symmetrical birds beautifully drawn or its compass drawn, biting their own legs. And a similar motif, a similarly complex motif at Galt. And perhaps equally striking, a bird preening at Galt and at Reading in one of the great corner springers at Reading. <coughs> These are all high quality sculptures, all in Kongstone, and the workshop can be traced from Henry's patronage in Normandy to works in Reading and at Norwich Castle. Now, what I want to do now, I could go in any direction, but the direction is it's going to go in, 
is to tell you about where the carved stones came from. Um, but first, a couple of pictures. First, this is a view of the cloister site in 2003, converted into a fetching little garden and looking southeast. On the right, the ruins of the refectory, on the south range, and on the left, the dormitory on the east range. The earliest view I have of this is from 1721. The striking thing about it is that the cloister arcade's already gone, and I'll return to that later. On the left, the south navile wall with the arch from the aisle in the northeast angle of the cloister. That's the doorway that had its arch rebuilt in stone in the 2003 to 5 restoration. You can see the triple arched entrance, the chapter house at the back. Where that wall met the wall of the south range, there was an arch, which is gone now. Yeah, uh, the, the uh, no point in pointing out this this arch here. It's gone now, but <coughs> you can see you can see where it was just there, and that arch gives us the size of the cloister. The position of that it gives a size of 145 feet for the cloister square. Now, a bit of geometry worked on the surviving voussoirs preserved in the museum tells us that each range of the cloister had approximately 36 arches with spans of about one metre. Now, I don't intend to work through all the reconstruction of the cloister. I've done it several times before. And if you're interested in the details, it's all been published. So I will tell you about the discovery of the carved stones and show you what the cloister arcades look like. The story, oh there, that's where it is. The story begins in 1912, when the Berkshire antiquarian Charles Keyser was excavating the Bishop's Palace at Home Park, Sonning, and noticed some Norman capitals lying about in the flower beds of the gardens. He rescued them and transported them to London, where he displayed them at the Society of Antiquaries and gave a paper about them in 1916. He also discovered that they had been taken to Sonning from Borough Marsh, an island in the Thames nearby, where they had formed part of a wall. Kieser was also told about an earlier batch of stones. It had been taken from Borough March to Ship Lake House across the river by some lads in a punt who took them away and these stones were turned into an ornamental arch made out of voussoirs and flanked by battlements of carved springers on the walls to either side. Of course Kieser wanted to go to Borough Marsh himself and see what else he could dig up but the Great War prevented him, and it was not until 1948 or 1949 that a colleague of George Janetsky's, then Conway librarian of this institute, noticed two beakhead voussoirs built into a new pair of gateposts at Borough Marsh Farm. George Janetsky decided to pick up where Kieser had left off in 1912. This is, um, before the Courtauld Institute was here, it was at Somerset House. And before it was at Somerset House, it was at this Adam Town House on Portman Square, just behind Selfridges. In 1948, Janetsky led a group of postgraduates, librarians, and secretarial staff from the Courtauld Institute in what I believe to be the Institute's only archaeological dig. And the vast quantity of material they unearthed now forms the bulk of the collection of Reading Abbey cloister stones in Reading Museum. If you're old enough, you might recognize George Janetsky in the center, 
with Donald King in front of him and Peter Lasco to the right with Henry Kelly. All of the material from Sonning, Shiplake and Borough Marsh is now in Reading Museum. And at my last camp we have a total of some 20 single capitals, one triple capital, 10 double string springers, 50 voussoirs, two corner springers and a couple of bases, all from the arcades of the cloister. What we also have is the record of its demolition in the form of detailed accounts of a sort of pick and pick your own sale of Abbey fabric that took place in 1549. <clears throat> From this, we can deduce that the arcade had fallen down by this time and it was sold off in two halves to a Mr. Sands, who paid 50 shillings for two rangers, and Mr. Gray, who paid 40 shillings for the other two. One of these two batches must have ended up at Bar Borough Marsh, and we have enough bourgeois, swingers, springers and capitals for a reconstruction of the cloister. The fact that the stones had fallen down before they were shipped explains the fact that we can actually reconstruct the entire cloister from half the stones. So there is a reconstruction of the North Walk and the West Walk. The North Walk decorated with um, chevron arches, the West Walk decorated with beakhead voussoirs. <coughs> but even if we couldn't manage the reconstruction, it would be clear enough from the stones themselves that the imagery was designed to warn against sin and vice. These are all Reading Abbey beakhead fouzoirs. To a medieval Christian, it was a terrifying sight made more vivid by garish colouring. The beakhead that decorated more than a quarter of the arches presents an alternation of fierce birds and grotesque heads of beasts or demons. The message of the foliate and figural arches was a more subtle one. A large proportion of the arcade was covered in tangled foliage, either issuing from the mouths of lions or inhabited by dragons or predatory birds. You might have wondered in your idle moments why so much of Romanesque sculpture depicts foliage in knots or tangles. <coughs> we can call it palmettes or Winchester acanthus and derive the motifs from more or less degraded Roman forms. And that's sort of missing the point. It seems clear enough that Romanesque carvers didn't use it just because they liked trees and shrubs. We're familiar with the idea that Roman vine scroll took on a new Eucharistic meaning to the in the Christian era. But this is not vine scroll, and the new meaning it took on had less in common with the mass than with the sleeping beauty, whose enchanted forest would trap all but the truly virtuous. And the enchantments laid in the forest that was Reading Abbey Cloister well, not the work of a wicked fairy godmother, but of the devil himself. Tangled foliage was widely used in the 12th century as a metaphor for hell, or for the snares and temptations of the world. This is most obviously the case for the Herefordshire School of Sculpture, where the hell from which Christ pulls Adam on the Erdsley font is shown not as flames, but as foliage. Almost every treatment of cloister iconography takes as its starting point Bernard of Clairvaux's well-known diatribe from his Apologia ad Guglielmum about monstrous and secular imagery in a cloister. In most cases, he's psychoanalyzed far beyond the words he actually wrote. We should remind ourselves, therefore, that the specific subjects he singled out for complaint were apes, lions, centaurs, 
composite creatures, tigers, soldiers and hunting scenes, subjects aimed at monks who had entered the house as adults after a life of more or less noble military service. He was especially critical of composite forms, combining parts of different animals and creatures with extra heads or extra bodies. From what I've shown you, I hope you'll agree that the cloister of Reading Abbey was not a place where Bernard would have felt at home. And as it was the major Cluniac foundation of its date in England, this seems hardly surprising. In fact, a polemic written in opposition to the Abbot of Clairvaux's apologia was circulating in, in England very soon after Bernard's production of his revised text in 1125 to 26. This is a so-called reprehensio, known in only one surviving late 12th century copy that belonged to the Augustinians of Southwark. The reprehensio is a systematic response to Bernard's denunciation of traditional monasticism and especially the Cluniac observance. But although it's 12,000 words long, it's an incomplete copy addressing less than half of Bernard's points and ending in the middle of a sentence. That might not matter so much were it not that what survives deals with only matters of, only with matters of diet and dress. The sections that doubtless answered the Abbot of Clairvaux's criticisms of the church and the liturgy are missing. It'd be nice if it, we could prove that it was written in Reading, though. And Don Wilmot, who published it, was confident that the likeliest author was Hugh of Amiens, writing as Abbot of Reading, and that the work must date from no earlier than 1127 to 28. From internal evidence, it's clear that the author was a Cluniac who was in England at the relevant time. He was in a position of authority in a monastery, and most probably an abbot, and that his background lay in France because he displayed a detailed knowledge of the monks of Savigny, Tyron, and the Cistercian order that would be impossible for one brought up in England. Finally, that he was a man of great authority and learning who was not awed by the Abbot of Clairvaux's reputation. <coughs> this narrows the field rather a lot. In fact, to either Hugh of Amiens or his successor, Ansgar. It seems certain, therefore, that it was produced at Reading and one of the fragment that remains to us wants the crucial section on cloister iconography is clear enough that somebody in authority there was concerned to position himself and his monastery in opposition to Bernard of Clairvaux. The argument that the author could have adduced is well known. These monstrous and demonic images were to be read as a metaphor for the traps of the devil with which the world is filled. This was imagery aimed specifically at monks. At Reading, where the foundation charter forbade child ablation, men who had led a full and active life before entering the mon monastery in their maturity, needed reminders of the world, what the world was really like lest they should lapse into wistful rep uh, reminiscence of illusory pleasures. Thanks. Thank